Hey Crave, Austin here from Galena. I am so glad to be talking with you all once again. This is my first time appearing to all of you from Crave Central, Crave HQ here in Freeport. Uh, first time on the screens. Uh, I gotta say, it's, uh, it's a little bit more, more cramped in here than I was expecting. Um, dad joke, I get it if you don't laugh, just practicing on you guys for my daughter. Appreciate the sacrifice. Well, here we are continuing with our series follow the leader. Uh, it's been such an excellent one so far with all of our teachers, your pastors across each of your campuses, teaching us all a bit about what it means to really live out a Christ-like life, to live out the gospel message, the joyful news that Jesus Christ is God. He loves everyone and he wants them all to turn away from the nasty things, the sinful things that hurt him, others, and themselves, and instead turn to him and the good things that he has prepared for them. That's the message that you are all called to share with your friends, your family, your schools, wherever you go. And that's a very important message to keep in mind as we dive into tonight's message, which is titled, Calling the Outcast, or if I could rename it without getting in trouble, The King's Dirty Robe. I'll explain that as we go along. Have any of you ever felt like you were rejected by someone, especially by a group you wanted to be a part of? You know, maybe it's a, a group of cool kids at, at, the, at your school that you really wanted to belong to, or maybe a team you tried out for and you couldn't pass the cut, or maybe it was more personal with a family member or a close friend who ended up turning their back on you. That's what it means to be an outcast. That's what it feels like. You know, I've experienced this a few times in my own life from a, a very young age on up, but I think the most noticeable occasion where I felt somewhat like an outcast was when I was a freshman in college. Now, for those of you who first met me at camp, you probably don't know this, but for those of you who have seen me outside of camp, you know that I, I dress really funny. Uh, you know those old black and white films from your grandparents or even great-grandparents era? Yeah, those are my main inspiration for how I dress. Seriously, look up Cary Grant or, or Frank Sinatra. You'll, you'll thank me later. But let's pause for a moment here. Have any of you seen your average college student? How do they like to dress? Usually sweatpants and a t-shirt, right? And here I was, dressed in a suit almost day, every day. I wore a tie literally every day, whether I had uh, a suit or just a sport coat at the time. And I had my collection of old-timey hats that I always liked to wear. Now, my college did have a dress code, so no one was allowed to just wear what they wanted. But trust me, I still stuck out pretty obviously. You know, at first people thought I was just kind of weird, but as time went on, they started to actually make fun of me. Some of them thought I was saying I was better than them because of how I dressed. Some thought it was just stupid. Why would I be wearing those clothes when I didn't have to? And I even had several tell me, oh, just wait till senior year. You'll get tired of it. But practically no one just accepted me or even my reason behind why I dressed like this. Instead, they just talked about me as that weird guy always wearing a suit and tie and fedora. You know, for a chunk of my college experience, especially that important first year when everyone is trying to fit in and, and find the group they belong with, I stood alone with very few friends and a lot of people who thought I was really weird, which I am, but that's not the only reason. I, in some ways, minor ways really, but in still some ways, I was an outcast. I wasn't part of the normal people and they treated me differently. You know, my beautiful, lovely wife had an even worse experience in junior high in her gym class. Now, as I said, she's beautiful and wonderful and all of that, but she's, she's never been the most athletic. And in gym class, she found she was always being picked last for teams. No one wanted her on their team. They just fought over who would get stuck with her. The other kids would tease her and make fun of her, and she felt like she was an outcast from the rest of her classmates because they told her they didn't want her around. It got so bad that her gym teacher once took her aside and told her that he believed in her and, and that she had worth. And as a gesture of kindness, he actually gave her a balloon just to show that someone cared for her. Well, her classmates saw the balloon and just because they were mean, they stole it and they popped it right in front of her. You can bet she felt like an outcast and that no one was caring for her in gym class. Now, of course, she feels very differently with yours truly around, but that's a very different story we won't get into here. But I share these stories with you because I want you to keep in mind as we dive into our scripture tonight. You see, Jesus cares about the outcasts. He cares about the weirdos, the, the, the weak ones, the boring ones, the strange ones, the annoying ones. He cares about them so deeply that he came to die for them so that they could feel included, be included in his family. But he didn't do just that. While he was here, he actually went to the ones no one else wanted to be around, the ones no one else cared about 
and he spent time with them. He showed care for them, and he just hung out with them when no one else would. So let's take a look, because I think this is going to be really powerful for all of us if we just open our hearts. So we're going to read about two outcasts who Jesus specifically went out of his way to include in his plan. And in fact, one of them even wrote an entire book of the Bible. One of them is named Levi, and the other is a woman who is so much of an outcast that we don't even have her name. She's just known as the sinful woman. But pay attention as we read these two little stories. Pay attention to how everybody else in the story reacts and then how Jesus reacts. So Mark 2, 14 through 16. As he, Jesus, passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And it happened that he was reclining at the table in Levi's house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many of them, and they were following him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? Luke chapter 8, 36 through 39. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him, Jesus, to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and kept wiping them with the hair of her head, and kissing his feet, and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Now let's take a pause here before we see how Jesus responds. I want to give you guys a, a crash course in history to help you understand what's happening in these two stories. So the Rem Roman Empire, right? Okay, Big cheeses, head honchos in the ancient world, took Israel over in about 60 years before Jesus' birth, and they started taxing the Israelites. The Roman method involved using locals to gather the taxes. So in Israel, that meant Jews were being used by the enemy to take money from their families, friends, and neighbors. Additionally, the way a tax collector would end up in a certain town to collect taxes was by literally bidding, like in an auction or an online auction or something like that, for that town. He would tell the Romans, yeah, they're going to give us about this much money in taxes. But he would always make sure the town was actually going to give more money than what he told the Romans, and he would keep the extra cash. Sometimes tax collectors would even lie to the people they were taxing and say the taxes were higher than what Rome was actually asking for, and again, pocket the extra gold. They were thieves because they stole that extra money. They were traitors because they worked for an enemy force and helped even fund the troops that oppressed the Jews. And the Jews especially saw them as evil because the rulers of Rome, the Caesars, the emperors, declared that they were gods. That meant when a Jew would pay taxes to Caesar in Rome, he was giving money to a false god. So that's the kind of person Levi and his friends were. They were completely outcast because of this. And oftentimes weren't allowed to go to synagogue, kind of the Jewish version of church back in the day. They often had to stand in the outer courts of the temple with the Gentiles, the, the non-Jews, and were often rejected by their own family so badly that their family would say that the tax collector was dead and refused to even acknowledge his existence. Now, the woman called a sinner could mean many things. It doesn't just mean she slipped up occasionally and, and lied here or there or thought about how much she hated a certain person rather than treating them nicely. It could mean she was a prostitute, sleeping around for money. It could mean she had committed one of the big sins in the Jewish law and was shunned because of it. It definitely means that she wasn't following the law of Moses, the law that God himself gave to the Jewish people and probably didn't do the right sacrifices, the right cleansing rituals, all of that. So to the Jews of her day, this means that this woman was literally living out of the protection of God. She was disobeying him so badly that she couldn't really even be considered much of a Jew. In fact, she probably literally lived away from the other Jews, maybe with others like her, maybe with the Gentiles who weren't Jewish because she was too unclean to be near the good Jews. She was kind of like the tax collectors, a person if you got too close to her could actually make you dirty and sinful. And you would have to go through some cleansing rituals just so that she didn't make you sin and cause God to be displeased with you. So that's who these people were. True outcasts from everybody, their family, their friends, everyone. The Jews hated them for being sinful. The Romans hated them because they were annoying and conquered people. They had no one but themselves. Keep in mind, these are real people even the woman whose name we don't know. They had dreams like you. They had 
feelings like you. They even had families like you who turned their back on them and said, my son is dead, my daughter is dead. Nothing can make them worthy in my eyes. So real quick, just compare. Pharisees were the good guys, okay, according to Jewish laws anyway. In a manner of speaking, they were kind of the pastors of the day who non-sinful Jews wanted to be like. They wanted to act good, to do all the right things, to stay clean, and expected anyone who wasn't clean to stay away from them, and anyone who was clean to stay far, far away from those sinful people so that they didn't get corrupted just by being with them. So when they say, see Jesus, this, this guy who's talking about following God and, and doing the right thing, sitting with these people who are making him dirty and unclean, they're shocked. In fact, the one story says the woman was touching Jesus' feet. It was bad enough to be around these people, but to have one touch you? Ugh, gross, get away from me, you disgusting sinner. But take a look here now about how Jesus responds to all of this. Let's dive back in and pick up where we left off, back in Mark when the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, the gross people, the unclean people, the, the thieves, the traitors, the people who don't do what God tells them to do, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, a doctor, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And back in Luke now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, the woman pouring the, the perfume and wiping her feet with her tears and hair, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner, a disgusting non-follower of God who's making him dirty with sin by touching him. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, ancient Jewish money, and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, well, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Wow. Look at this, Craig, because this is so important, what I really, truly want you to get out of this message tonight. These are dirty, sinful people doing all sorts of things that Jesus would never do. That technically makes them condemned under Jewish law, meaning that in some ways they're condemned by God. And here he is going out of his way to make them feel cared for, to make them feel seen, to make them feel valued again when others are literally wishing they were dead. Do you see this, Crave? Remember, Jesus is literally God. He's the one about who the Pharisees are saying, don't go near these people or he won't accept you as a good enough person. He won't protect you and take care of you anymore. And he's literally doing the thing that they said will make God turn away from you. That's the God we serve. That's the Jesus who came down to this earth. Not some fairy tale guy in a white robe. He's eating with robbers and liars. He's letting a woman with a, a bad reputation touch him with her dirty, sinful hands and hair. And guess what? He's telling them, these outcasts who everybody else in their life has rejected, I want to be with you. I want to give you a place to belong to. No longer be an outcast, but instead be accepted, and I will make you clean. And here's the takeaway, Crave. Jesus wants people to be good Christians. He wants them to follow him, to pray, to read their Bibles, and, and go to church. Those are all very important things. But before he asks all of that, he calls to them while they're in their junk in their mess, while they're still sinners, and says, I want you to belong. That's why I called this the king's dirty robe. Jesus is not afraid of getting his robes dirty by hanging with the dirty people. For those of us who are Christians who truly believe that Jesus is God and Lord, that he came, died, and rose again, that's the standard he wants from us. Not what the Pharisees said. You see, the Pharisees said, clean yourself up, and then you can belong. Jesus said, you belong, so I'm going to clean you up. 
I want to challenge you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, to look around you at the tax collectors and sinners in, in your life, in your family, in your school. Look for the outcasts, the ones no one wants to be around because they're, they're weird or, or gross or dress or talk funny or aren't good at sports or video games or maybe even are into things that you know are bad and sinful. These are the ones who Jesus wants to save, and he wants to use you to do it. Notice that Jesus never sinned while he was with the sinners. You don't have to tell them that it's okay what they're doing. In fact, in one story in Luke with another tax collector, a man named Zacchaeus, Jesus helps him to change his heart, and Zacchaeus goes so far as to say, I'm going to pay back four times as much as I stole from my own people. So don't fall into the patterns of sin that they're doing, but don't avoid them or ignore them because of those patterns either. Love them like Jesus did, where he met them where they were at. He accepted them and through relationship helped guide them toward changing their behavior. Because it's not the behavior that's really the problem, Grave. It's a symptom, like a, a cough or, or a runny nose when you have a cold, but the real issue is deep inside of you. It's a virus in your body. The heart is where it matters. And you are called to be like Jesus by loving that heart and saying to them, Jesus loves you so much. He'll take you with your messes and your sins. You belong if you let him come into your home. For those of you who maybe aren't sure about Jesus or this whole Christian thing, or, or for those of you who are but still feel like an outcast, I want you to know this. Jesus wants to meet you where you're at. He wants to come to your house like he did with Levi and, and Zacchaeus. He wants to hang out with you. He's not up there judging you and, and keeping a score of how many bad things you've done in a book. Yes, Jesus knows your sins better than even you do. But that's why he wants to come and know you. He wants you to know that you belong. You belong to him and his father. You belong in a place of love and peace and joy and excitement. And Jesus wants to heal your sickness like he wanted to with Levi's friends. He wants to forgive your sins like he did with the sinful woman. And most of all, he wants you to be with him. So let's wrap this thing up. Whichever camp you fall into, whether you're someone who is currently following Jesus or you aren't there yet, I want to leave you with this. Let Jesus bring that sense of belonging to you. Let him invite you to his cool kids table. And when he does, you start doing the same. Crave, you are all called by God and he loves you so much. He wants to be with you, to have you be with him, just like the tax collectors and the sinners. But he wants your classmates your family, your friends, your neighbors to be with him as well. So I challenge you this week, ask Jesus to make himself known to you, to give you that sense of belonging, to feel his compassion and love, and then to look for the tax collectors in your life and show them that same compassion and love. It's hard. You'll have people make fun of you and judge. Jesus did and he's God for crying out loud. But I tell you this, Crave. The love of Jesus is so worth it. And once you experience it, you want everyone to know that they too are being called from outcast to son and daughter. And that Jesus wants to recline at their table and say, your sins are forgiven. Come and join me at my father's table.